Hi, I'm Preston Williams, and welcome to another edition of Jazz Talk. Today on our show, we are joined by one of the greatest musicians in the history of music. This gentleman has been on the scene for almost 60 years and has worked with many greats from Ray Charles, Rashawn Roland Kirk, McCoy Tyner, Herbie Hancock, so many, Carmen Lundy, Carlos Santana, I can go on and on. He's worked with everyone. He's a trombonist, educator, arranger. Please welcome to Jazz Talk, the legendary Mr. Steve Jure. How are you, sir? I'm good. <laughs> Looking yeah. good, man. Looking good. Well, listen, thanks for uh, coming on Jazz Talk today. And uh, it's just good to see you. You look well. And uh, just to chat it up with you. Now, uh, I'm interested in knowing a little bit more, Steve, about your humble beginnings and your background. Now, I saw you recently. We were chatting a little bit. You're from uh, Omaha, Nebraska, correct? No, I, I just was born there. Oh, but you grew up in, <laughs> you, you grew up in San Francisco Bay Area, though. Yeah, I mean, my, my dad was going to Creighton University in Omaha. Okay. GI Bill after the Second War when I was born and he graduated and they moved back to the Bay Area before I was one year old. Uh -huh. So it says on my passport I was born in Omaha, but I was, you know, I wasn't there but a couple of months. I, I, no, I'm not from there. I was just born there. <laughs> gotcha. Now you come from an interesting background. You got a, a big family. Uh, I know you got some uh, siblings, your brothers play uh, instruments as well. Now, you have an interesting background in the sense your mother is a Mexican ancestry and your dad Italian. Is that correct? Yes. You know what's interesting? Everyone's always thought that you were Puerto Rican, man. Well, that's, that's, a rumor, that's a rumor that's been going around for the longest time, you know? I even thought that too. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. I don't yeah. have a problem with that. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll, I was just in Puerto Rico in June for the festival. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was great. I love Puerto Rico, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was yeah. it was a good uh a good occasion to catch up because Chucho was there and Paquito and and uh we played together with Dizzy and uh, you know, all my friends, Miguel Zeno and Davi Sanchez and uh I played with Charlie Sepulveda, and, and it was like great to see everybody and hang out and listen to each other, and you know, it was beautiful. Beautiful, man. Now, you started playing trombone at age 10. Why trombone? Why'd you pick that, Steve? I don't know. I just, some I, you know, I went to the band, my older brother played saxophone, and uh, he played in a school band. You got him in the fourth grade. Mm. And uh, so I wanted to play too, because it looked like fun. Yeah. So I went to the band room, to the band uh, teacher, and, and I said, I want to play in the band. He said, what grade are you in? He said, I said, third grade. He said, no, 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 you got to be in the fourth grade. Come back next year. Mm -hmm. So I came back and he said, you in the fourth grade now? I said, yeah. He said, okay, what instrument do you play? I said, I don't know. And so he said, well, pick an instrument. And there were two big posters up on the wall. One was the orchestra instruments, mm -hmm. you know, the violin, the viola, the cello, the contrabass, the timpanis, the snare drum, the bass drum, all the woodwinds, all the brass, you know. <clears throat> the other picture was a marching band. Yeah. And what's in the front row with a marching band because of the slide? That trombone. Yeah, I saw that trombone or something said, I want to play that one. So he said, OK, good. We need trombone players because everybody, they always need trombone players. Yeah. And it's uh, it's not easy, especially in the beginning. You know, the other instruments can become get a sound and become fluid, uh, play a part much quicker than on the trombone. Yeah. And uh, I picked it up and I learned to tune the first day. You know, and I pretended I was reading, but I was really playing it by ear. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. you know, I just stuck with it. I've never quit. But I think around junior high, maybe in, in middle school, they had a little band. Uh, that's They had a jazz band. Mm -hmm. But they also had a little band outside of the jazz band in school. And we would play for the basketball games. And we would 
played New Orleans traditional songs like Saints Go Marching In, Muskrat Ramble, Bourbon Street Parade, or Tin Roof Blues, these kind of tunes. Yeah. And I started improvising in the New Orleans style first, you know. And somehow in that at that time, some, I just knew this is what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. This feels right. This is something I want to do. Yeah. And uh, then when I got in high school, someone gave me a J.J. Johnson record. Ooh. And it was all over. I didn't even know you could play a trombone like that. Man, man. Yeah. That's incredible. And eventually you went on to be able to work with him, too. Yeah. Yeah. Which is great. There's something that I found interesting uh, about your background, Steve. I didn't know, man, that your grandfather was one of the owners of the San Francisco 49ers. Yeah, one of the original half owner. Wow. Yeah, it's funny. You know, he worked, he was an accountant. And then he ended up working on the Hoover Dam as an accountant when they were building the Hoover Dam. Yeah. So he lived, he moved to Phoenix for that time. And I, he anyway, he ended up working with this guy, Del Webb, mm -hmm. who ended up having casinos in uh, Vegas when the yeah. casino started up. And he wanted my grandpa to come and work with be his uh, accountant for the casino. Mm -hmm. And he didn't want to do it because he didn't want to join the family, you know. I got you. Oh, yeah. I didn't understand that. Yeah. And, but Del Webb really liked him and gave him a nice taste, you know. And back then, of course, a dollar was worth a lot more than it was now, you know. Yeah. So, and anyway, the NFL was just starting. There was no TV. I'm not even sure if they even had radio for every game. Mm. But... The only revenue was in behinds in the seats. You know, and if the stadium didn't fill up, they, you lost money. And after a couple of years of, of losing money, he sold his interest out. Wow. wow. But they, they gave him, they always gave him uh, season tickets, uh, you know, out of respect to being one of the original owners. So when I was a kid, he always took me to the 49er games, you know, and he'd have great seats, uh, box seats on the 50 yard line. And, you know, it was fun, man. I used to like to go to the games with him. Yeah, that's great. Now, speaking of you being a musician, you were also a pretty good athlete, I understand. And weren't you supposed to go to college on a football scholarship? Well, it, it wasn't exactly a scholarship in terms of money. Mm -hmm. What happened is, um, it's interesting how it happened. <laughs> you know, I always liked to play sports. I would always play after school and stuff. But uh, in high school, you had, to, it was, so many schools are like this and it's horrible, but this is the way America is. Football is more important than music, you know, of course. And you couldn't play in the concert band or the jazz band unless you'd played in marching band. And uh, I hated marching band. <laughs> really? Yeah, man, we want to get up and be there at 6.30 or 7 in the morning. So to practice before school and sometime it'd be so cold late in the fall that the mouthpiece was metal, it'd stick to your lip, you know, and all that kind of stuff, man. Yeah. And then when you're marching, lifting your feet, the horn moves around on your lips. You cannot get a good sound. The only thing you can do is play as loud as you can. It's not musical. I don't like the music because it's military music. It's about conflict. It's not about healing and bringing people together. It's about war. I just ain't, that's not my thing. Yeah. And the only way to get out of it is by playing on a football team. <laughs> so... I went out for football and I made the team, made first string. Yeah. I was a wide receiver. And uh, so 
by the time I graduated high school, uh, Vietnam was in full swing. Now, I didn't believe in that war. I have to stand with Muhammad Ali on that one. The, right. the people over there didn't do anything to America or threaten this country in any way. And it was really about corporate interests with them rubber plantations over there and all kind of stuff. And I, I really wasn't interested in going over there and killing people that I had no conflict with, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I got offered admission to Sacramento State to play football. Because to be honest with you, my grades wasn't all the best because I was between, between sports and playing. I, I played in several bands outside of school. So I was gigging on the weekends mm -hmm. and doing rehearsals after school. And I wasn't really hitting the books. Yeah. But they said, well, that's all right. The academic will let that slide. Come and play football. Right, right. So I went and I played football. And... Uh, I studied real hard and I got Dean's list. So they said, you don't have to be in athletics if you don't want to. Cause I, I, I let them know I really liked music. So I changed to music major after one year of football. Now at the school that you were attending, you were only there what for a couple of years and then you transferred, didn't you? Yeah. 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 So music was definitely in your future. That was uh, your passion. Now, what I find interesting, uh, I guess when you came out in the late 60s, uh, one of the first people you played with was uh, Hannibal Peterson, correct? Well, that was, see, after I was in Sacramento State for two years, mm -hmm. I had heard that North Texas had a great jazz program. And so I transferred down there. Mm -hmm. And that's when I met Hannibal. Well, at that time, it was Marvin Peterson and the Soul Masters. Right, right. And we used to play, uh, you know, funk, and we'd play Hugh Masekela stuff. And we, once Miles went into fusion, like in a silent way, we'd play some of them tunes. And, and you know, it was fun, man. We had a good band. And, uh, uh, well, you know, I did, it, I did a year and a half of North Texas and then I left. It was really preparation for the LA studio scene. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They, at that time, at that time, it's different now, but at that time, they had Stan Kenton's complete library. They didn't have any of Duke Ellington's music. Big band, they had seven big bands, no Duke Ellington music. The, the, the only Count Basie charts they had was, uh, uh, um, uh, Sammy Nistico and uh, Neil Hefty, which were okay. great charts, loved playing them. Yeah. I loved, it was great music, but they didn't have no Ernie Wilkins, they didn't have no Thad Jones. You know, they didn't teach Charlie Parker, they taught Phil Woods. Mm -hmm. They didn't teach uh, Miles Davis, they taught Chet Baker. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know what I'm saying. I know what you're saying. And I had already played with Roland Kirk by that time, and I knew the truth about the music. So after a year and a half, I dropped out and just started gigging. Vietnam was over. And, you know, I moved back to the Bay Area and worked with Rassam when he'd come through town and played with Santana and Van Morrison. Yeah. You know, the rock scene out there was strong. Now, Steve, how did you meet and hook up with Ray Charles? Well, I had heard that they had an opening for trombone, so I went down to L.A. and auditioned for it. And, uh, you know, I got the gig, and yeah. uh, that was something else. Boy, that was amazing. Just listening to him sing every night was yeah. really special, man. I can only imagine. Wow. Wow, that's incredible. You know, yeah. working with someone like him, what would you say your biggest takeaway was, Steve? Working with a giant like that early in your career, you know, because that was probably the biggest artist you'd worked with probably up until that point, you know? Well, Rasan, I worked with Rasan before Ray. Right. 
But it's a sim. It's interesting. They were both blind. Yeah. yeah. And Woody Shaw was damn near blind. So somehow I communicated on another kind of level, where it was about listening and about the sound. You know, Rassam taught me how to listen another kind of way. Because he didn't see his it was a world of sound. You know, right. and um, I remember. You know, I this is before I played with Ray, but when he come through town, I didn't tour with him. I was in the Bay Area, but when he come through town, he called me, and uh, he said, "Are you you doing anything next week?" I said, "No." He said, uh, "I'm gonna be at the both end. You want to make it?" I said, "Yeah, you know." <laughs> Heck yeah! I'm not turning that gig down. And so you know, I was a kid. I was like 19 or 20 or something. And, and he gave me 50 bucks for the week and I didn't care. It was like going to school, you know? Yeah. And I remember one time I had played New Orleans traditional and Rasan did play, on the gig. He might play the whole history of the music. He might do a tune that's New Orleans style. And then he'd do a uh, blues and he might do a bird tune, an Ellington tune, whatever. He knew the whole history of the music, but he wasn't just copying people's licks from those eras. It was authentically Rassan's voice, right. but he knew those styles to express, you know, different voicing, different harmonic approaches for the different eras. And so it's all beautiful, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so one time he did an Ellington tune and I took a solo. And afterwards, he told me, he said, man, don't be playing no bebop on this at Duke Ellington. I said, well, what do you mean? And he could tell I didn't know. He said, well, as far back as you can go will directly influence how far forward you can go. Mm. He said, you're skipping the, the New Orleans and then there's bebop and you're skipping what came in between. You know, so he took, he, he used to travel with one of them little record players and and uh, some LPs in his suitcase. He had one suitcase with records, another suitcase with clothes in his big bag with all his horns. Right. And uh, so he took me up to his hotel room after the gig one night. And he, he always get a room right across from the elevator, so he didn't have to go looking for a room. He can't see. So he go in there and he, he's very, man, he didn't need no help, man. He opened the door and all that stuff and he opens the door and he knew where everything in the room was. He could say, go sit in that chair over there. So I go sit down, he closed the door, man, it's dark in there. I can't see my hand in front of my face. <laughs> and he say, man, I'm gonna play you something. So in the dark, he can put on the records and he could feel, you know how records got them grooves in it? Yeah. And each different cut is a different tune. Mm -hmm. He could feel the little space between the grooves with his fingertip, like reading Braille, you know? Yeah. And he put the needle right at that place. And he put on these tunes, put on Vic Dickinson or Lawrence Brown or someone from that era. He said, see how they're phrasing? See, it's different than New Orleans. <clears throat> but it ain't bebop. And, and and I say, yeah, I like that. But JJ, he said, but JJ, nothing. This came, JJ wouldn't be do, what, doing what he was doing if it wasn't for these guys before them. He come out of that. You got to make the connection. Yeah. Uh, he said, you try and play that stuff. So I went and got the record and I tried to play it and I couldn't play it. And it messed me up. I said, oh man, yeah, there's something to this, you know. And so, you know, I started really researching and studying what came before me. Mm -hmm. So all the time I was with Woody Shaw, and man, we were playing some real advanced stuff, man, harmonically and everything, and, you know, more so than what they're doing now. Now it's just like funk fusion, here we go, you know, right? and they call it jazz. But um, we were pushing it. At the same time I was touring with that, I was listening, you know, to some of the early cats that I didn't get to hear live. Yeah, yeah. 
to 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 make that connection and see how you know everything is related it's a chain yeah it's like a chain the you lineage know, i was going to ask you about woody shaw personally one of my favorite trumpet players just a genius even miles davis said woody plays different than all of them you know he, yeah. he had a lot of respect for woody i mean the guy's chops his harmonic concept i mean he was he was a master you know, we didn't have him long but uh, innovate yeah innovate Oh yeah, yeah, and he was like a mentor to you, didn't he? Sort of like push you too, you know. He uh, took you under his wing, big time. Yeah. And he let me write for him, and he also let me arrange and and notate his original music for some of the record dates. Mm -hmm. And uh, man, he would give me license to go for it, you know. And, you know, I remember, I really clearly remember one night we were playing at the Vanguard mm -hmm. and there's this tune called Moon Train. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm I'm on the record, but I didn't solo on the record. Right. But I played on the on the record because he couldn't let the sextet. Azar Lawrence was playing Lawrence, yeah. saxophone. And of course, it, it with a sextet, everybody can't solo on every tune. It'd be too long, you right. know. But that record, The Moon Train, also was my first composition recorded and my first solo on record. Yeah. But I didn't play on the tune Moon Train, but we were playing the song on the Vanguard. Of course, on the gig, I'd play on it. Yeah, I remember that came out, I think it's 1974, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's right. yeah, something like that. yeah. and, and anyway, you know, I played my solo and Woody played first, and then I played my solo, and then Mulgrew was playing. And while while Mulgrew was playing, Woody come over and he whispered in my ear. He said, hey, Steve, uh, you, you remember that stuff you played on the bridge, coming out of uh, the bridge on your second chorus? And I said, well, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, man. I was trying something, and I kind of dug myself a hole. He said, no, 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 that's cool. That's cool. I like that. Because I never heard no other trombone player play those intervals before you mm. keep looking for it. Keep looking for it. You'll find it. Just resolve it. Wherever you end up, just resolve it. Mm. Don't make it make sense. Yeah. <clears throat> he gave me license. A lot of band leaders don't want you to stretch you know, too much, and they don't want you to get more applause and them all that kind of nonsense. Uh, Woody was quite the opposite, was all about the music. All about the music. All about the music. Dizzy was like that too, man. Dizzy, I learned so much from Dizzy. You know, man, I could tell you, he's the real father of the modern stuff. Oh, yeah, without question. You know, I was just thinking about, now, wasn't uh, Woody responsible for helping you or getting you to Art Blakey? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he introduced me. Man, man, man. So what, was like, working, what was it like working with Art Blakey? Well, <laughs> I didn't work with him that long, but it was amazing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a time for Art. There was, you know, everybody has ups and downs, and it was a slower period for him. Mm -hmm. And so the trombone was the extra horn. And most of the gigs, he just had bread for the quintet, which trumpet and saxophone. Mm -hmm. And then some gigs, um, he'd have money. He hired the trombone to him, make it a sextet, three horns. And so, see, the uh, it was 72 hours with Ray, Ray Charles. So it was the late spring, 73. Woody in a Keystone Corner in San Francisco. Uh, Art was coming through and Woody was going to be on the gig and he brought me down and introduced me to Art. And I sat in and Art asked me to join the band. And so we finished a week at, at um, Keystone. Yeah. To dig this, this is crazy. I sat in with him and played a couple of tunes at the end of the set. They used to do three sets. So the second set, I sat in and played a couple of tunes. 
And they said, well, stay and play the next set. So I, what tunes, they had a few original tunes I laid out on them, but I knew the classic ones. You know, we did Moaning, Wizard mm -hmm. God, Blues March, Long Came Betty, you know, them classic, because I had the records. Right. And uh, then he said, play a ballad, and I did a ballad feature, if I think I remembered. It might as well be Spring, that's what I played. Mm -hmm. And of course, Cedar Walton, that's when I met Cedar. He was in the band. And I've been working with Cedar ever since then. And Cedar accompanied me, which made it easy to play, man, because he's such a great accompaniment. But um, anyway, Art said, you want to join the band and go to New York? I said, yeah. He said, OK, be in the studio tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning. I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> man. You say, ask Woody, he'll he'll tell you about it. So I I show up at the studio at 10 in the morning. Now, Orrin Keepnews is producing the record. Orrin Keepnews, yeah. And I had just sit in the night before, and, and I come in there, this little kid with a trombone, and who are you? What are you doing here? And Art, you know, Art say, he's in the band now. You know, so Orrin backed off. He said, well, all right. You know, <laughs> a funny story. Man. And now, they playing original stuff they've been playing on. It. I didn't know none of this stuff. So Woody had two tunes, and he wrote out a third harmony part for me on two tunes. Mm -hmm. So I just played the part. I didn't get no solos or nothing, but I got on the record. You know, Great, man. but boy, you talk about like just throw you in the boiling water and you got to swim and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, be in the studio tomorrow, 10, 10 o'clock. I said, what? Yeah. <laughs> then, we played, then we played a week in St. Louis at La Casa. We did a week at the Showcase in Chicago. Mm -hmm. We opened at the Village Gate in New York. Mm -hmm. Opening night at the Village Gate, I'm playing the first set, and I noticed this little guy in the front table right in front of me just sitting there looking at me like this. And fortunately, I didn't recognize Curtis Fuller. And he's, he's not tall, he's up to about my shoulder. And to me, he was a giant. I had the records and like, it's like Curtis, you know, after JJ is Curtis, you know. And uh, then I still didn't recognize him at first, you know. And so on the break, I go to the bar and, and and I don't drink alcohol, but I got a soda and I was talking to people. And then I go back after a while and get ready for the second set. And I always put my horn in the case. This is before I had a trombone stand. So I don't want it to get banged up. The slide is very delicate. So I put it, I'm gonna get my horn out the case and Art say, hey Steve, come over here. I want you to meet Curtis Fuller. And I was like, ah, what? You know, so my heart start beating and stuff, you know, I thought everyone could hear it. <laughs> and and uh, uh, anyway, Curtis was real sweet, you know, he said, oh, welcome to New York, Steve. He said, not many of us get a chance to go to this school, referring to the messengers, you know, yeah. and especially referring to trombones, you know, because before me, it w well, it was Curtis and then uh, Julian Priester played with Art Blakey and Slide Hampton played with Art Blakey. And then I came in. After me, then came uh, Robin Eubanks. Oh, Tim Williams. Tim Williams. Robin Eubanks. Uh, Frank Lacey and then uh, Steve Davis. But that's mm -hmm. it for the trombone of the message. Not too many, not too many. Yeah. Anyway. You know, he talked to me, he's real sweet, Curtis, and we're back in the dressing room and say, oh yeah, welcome, man, sound great, you know, keep it up and blah, blah, blah. And then Art started his stuff, you know. So, well, you know, Curtis, uh, you're still a jazz messenger. You'll always be a jazz messenger. Get your horn. And Curtis said, Art, man, I, my horn's up at the pad. You know, man, I don't, want, I don't want to play at Steve's turn. I've been here and did this. No, I want you to get get go get your horn. He said, you're going to give me cab fare to go up to Harlem from the village and, and get my horn. And, and of course, Art didn't want to give up no money. So he Art looked at me and said, well, 
Steve, can Curtis play your horn? And Curtis didn't want to play, but he looked at me and he said, man, he's not going to let me off the hook. Could I play a song? I said, I, I said Curtis, here, bless it for me. And I give him my horn. So he only played one song. But I tell you something. Um, later that same summer of 73, Curtis got mugged in Harlem. And he gave him his wallet, but the guy hit him in the mouth with the gun barrel anyway and knocked out all his teeth in the front. Mm. And that's after that he had false teeth put in, like like the kind you put the polygrip in. You know, plates like in the cartoon, the chompers. And he went with Basie. That's when he went with Basie playing third trombone just in the staff trying to get his sound back. But when he played my horn that night, he sounded the way he sounded on Blue Train. With my mouthpiece, too. And he came in. And he said, here, he give me the horn. I said, ah. <laughs> so, I, you know, I didn't play on that song. Yeah. But what am I going to do after that? So, you know, he played his song, took his bow, and got off. And so talk about having to scrape yourself off the floor. Lordy, lordy. So I, you know, I went and played the best I could. I really tried to play the music, play with the band, swing. You know, I didn't try and play high and loud and fast and impress people on that nonsense. I just tried to play the music. And Curtis really appreciated the fact that I wasn't competitive and trying to show off, but tried. I was trying to do the music first. Mm -hmm. So he gave his number, we exchanged numbers and became friends. He showed me stuff, you know, we'd go over and hang out. And uh, we've been friends ever since to the end, you know. And uh, yeah, We lost him like a, what, a couple of years ago, I believe. Yeah, that yeah. Point. But uh, that's beautiful, man. I love these stories that you're sharing. Now, I wanted to ask you, I wanted to go back a little bit uh, in regard to you playing seashells, which is incredible, so creative. Was uh, Rashawn Roland Kirk instrumental in you doing that? He indirectly, yes, because he had a shell. One time when he came through San Francisco, he had a shell along with all the other stuff he had. And so we did three nights, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And after the gig Thursday night, we packing up. And I, and I said to the, about the shell, I said, I see the shell there. You ever going to play that? And he said, well, I play when the time is right. <laughs> okay. So, you know, man, now look, it's a club. Anybody can come in there. You never know who's going to come in. It's open to the public. So Friday night, this couple come in, sit right in the front row, right in front of the bandstand, and proceed to get drunk like crazy drunk. Mm -hmm. Start talking to each other and talking loud. And, and all I remember is the woman was telling me, man, I told you to take out the garbage. So I did. She, she said, no, you didn't. You left it by the side of the car. And they going on and on. And, and, and oh, the people was getting drugged. Rasan wanted to play a ballad. And it was, so he picked up the seashell. Now, you know, Rasan was the, the real champion of circular breathing. Mm -hmm. That whole nonsense with Kenny G was a joke. That was to promote his record. You know, that wasn't no real stuff. And, and, uh, Rasan pick up the shell and he just played the note to the shell make a primary tone. Ooh. But he held it for about five minutes, you know. Now that's a long time. Finally, these people realize something's going on and they quit talking. They look up like in amazement, like, and as soon as they quit talking, look up, the whole club start clapping. Yay, everybody. <laughs> And then it was quiet. It was so quiet you could hear the pin drop. And and so he went into this ballad on a tenor saxophone, real breathy style, kind of like Ben Webster-ish. You know, he go right. Oh, it was beautiful, man. What a moment. I never forget it. But it was the sound of the shell that brought peacefulness. It just mm -hmm. cleared the air. It took all that nonsense out the air and just made it so beautiful. So it touched me, the sound of it, boom, went in. And 
after the gig, I asked him, could I try that? He said, go ahead. And so I went blue and on on and oh man, it was it, something internally went boing, you know. So I, my, my mom was taking a vacation in Hawaii uh, some months after that. And I said, yeah. if you see a shell, pick me up a shell. So she got me my first shell. And I still have it, and I still play it. I play it on all my gigs, man. Man, I was blown away, you know, when I saw your Keystone Corner a few weeks back. That was incredible. That was that show smoked, and uh, that was actually my first time seeing you. I've known about you for a while, but I says, man, I've never seen Steve Teray in concert before. But that that was fantastic. Band was tight. You guys were on point. I'm telling you, that was a yeah. amazing show. But mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, Saturday Night Live Band. How'd you get involved with that? Because you've been Associated with them for almost 40 years, man. 37. 37? Yeah. Coming up before. How did that come about? Well, there's two gigs in my life that have been wonderful gigs that I had to audition for. Ray Charles and Saturday Night Live. So I auditioned. And I got the call. And I've been there ever since. <laughs> Great, man. And I'll tell you something. It's been a blessing because it's... Well, it's fun, of course, you know, it is what it is. It's not like playing with Dizzy Gillespie. It's a different thing, but it's a good band, all fine musicians, and, and we have fun and challenge. Some of the charts are really challenging, too, like Tower Power kind of articulations, a lot of uh, heavy articulation stuff. And, um, you know, when we're not playing, we're laughing. So hey, what kind of what more can you ask for? It's a long day. It's a real burnout. But uh, anyway, it has enabled me to do so many creative things. For instance, those shell choir recordings. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't make any money on that. It all went to pay the musicians. You know, but it it still gave me an opportunity because the show got my bills paid, and. And I was able to do these big projects. Yeah. Even like this last record I just did. Okay. I had your lot latest of, recording. Yeah. Yeah, I had a lot of special guests on that that were uh, above and beyond budget, but this was my musical vision and enabled me to realize that, you know. Yeah. That's beautiful, man. So it's been a blessing, you know. Yeah. Now, you're also an educator too, Steve. Uh, is that something you enjoy doing, teaching, uh, you know, helping and giving back to students? Because uh, you, you, like I said, as an arranger, composer, and uh, educator, man, you do it all. But is teaching something you enjoy doing? Yeah. You know, it's, if the kid is student, if the kid is serious and, and really wants to play, I'm all there for him, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the only way you keep the music alive is to pass it on. So, you know, I'm, somebody helped me out coming up. Yeah. But I, I don't sugarcoat a form. I tell them it like it is. And, you know, a lot of them don't want to hear the fact that the music really has Af African origins. That's right. And that's the root of all this stuff, you know. And, and a lot of them don't want to hear that. And uh, if they don't want to hear that, it's their, it's their loss. So I, I lose interest in teaching people that aren't open to the truth. Right. Yeah. And it's about the rhythm first, you know. Everything's about the rhythm. That's right. Yeah. And, and uh, so I emphasize those points. And, uh, but, you know, there's a, a lot of, I mean, a lot of people I've studied with me, uh, Michael Dees is one of my students. This other guy, Nick Finzer, he's one of my students. Uh, Wycliffe Gordon, I showed him how to use the plunger. I taught him, went and called me up, told me to show him the plunger. Um, you know, lots of people. I remember early on, I, I did a few things with showing Steve Davis some stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so many, you know, and I enjoy teaching, especially when they go on and carry the music forward. That's mm -hmm. my reward. Yeah. Hey, man, you've also worked with uh, some other musicians. I didn't bring up one of my personal favorite pianists, one of the greatest of all time, uh, the late McCoy Tyner. You also work with Herbie Hancock, too. What was it like working with those guys, man? Uh, heaven. 
<laughs> you know, it, it, pure inspiration. Like, uh, you know, when you play with somebody on that level, it's actually easy. You got to listen. It's all about listening anyway. Mm -hmm. But we listen to each other's space and, and, and it's like a conversation. You know, and you create a, a, a story of sound. Right. And, uh, you know, Herbie has these fantastic colors and, and, and the way he leaves space and then responds is unique and just amazing. And McCoy has this rhythmic, ferocious, rhythmic drive that, that never is in your way, always uplifting and, and complimenting and opening doors for you to go to another level of energy. And, yeah. it keep, and of course, saxophone can keep going, whereas brass, you know, you got a different endurance situation going on. So, you know, I build up and then after a while I have to bow out because <laughs> I can't go on no more. But McCoy could just keep building you and building you and building you and building you because you listen to the way he played with Train. Well, you know, speaking of Train, Steve, I was talking to drummer Joe Chambers and he was telling me, he says, Preston, he said, it wasn't Elvin Jones driving that band. He said it was McCoy Tyner. And I'm like, man, I've never heard anybody say that because, you know, yeah. he thinks he's yeah. a drummer, but he said McCoy was driving that band. Yes, I agree totally. Haven't played with him and haven't played with Elvin. Yeah. Because I work with Elvin, Art, Max. Uh, I got to do a week with Philly Joe Jones once. Oh, Philly Joe. Oh, wow. And uh, only did, Roy Haynes I love too, but I only did a, a couple of times a jam session at some festival. At the end of the festival, they got an all-star jam or something like everybody plays. And, and I got to play with him, but I never really worked in the band with Roy Haynes, but I love the way he plays too. But uh, I've worked with Max and Art and Elvin and Fitz and Joe. Wow. All those cats. Did you ever get a chance to do anything with Miles Davis? No. That would have been nice. But I played, I played with Dizzy, with yeah. Fred, and with Woody. Yeah. That that's that's pretty incredible, man. Very few musicians uh, can yeah. say that you know were with us today. You play, when, with you know, it's funny. When before he got famous, he did some gigs with me, and he's on one of my earlier records, and and he's he's a hell of a trumpet player. My goodness, yes, yes he is. And you know, the thing that's amazing, Steve, is that you were associated and work with these giants early in your career, late teens into your twenties. I mean. Uh, Art Blakey, Sean Roland Kirk, Ray Charles, you know, it's incredible. It's really, really incredible. And uh, just what you're doing, man, like I said, I'm still thinking about the show that you did at Keystone. Uh, that was amazing. And I hope, hope, hopefully you'll come back soon, man. I definitely want to want to see you again. I did want to ask you, uh, you know, when you're home, just relaxing, chilling by yourself or with your family, what is Steve Ture listening to? What music, do you, if I came over to your house right now and we just sat and kicked it and Chad, what are you listening to right now? Who you, you know? What what, what uh, records do you put on when you're home? You know, I'm curious. Well, you know, it's funny when I'm at home. In my house, I don't listen that much. Mm -hmm. If I, it, um, you know, if I get a new CD, a lot of people, students or whatever, other musicians give me their latest CD, I'll check it out. Yeah, I do most of my listening in the car when I'm traveling going somewhere, you know, and uh, I got to tell you, I, I, I like, there's a radio station, Columbia University here, mm -hmm. and I'd say about 80% or well, maybe 70% of what they do is jazz, yeah. but they also have a, a Brazilian music show, the ladies in Brazilian music or classic Brazilian or they have an African music show or an Indian music show from India or uh, a country music show. But this is authentic country, not the country rock Nashville of today. I'm talking about Patsy Cline and stuff like that. And, you know, I enjoy listening to authentic musics. So, you know, I, I like all kind of music from around the world. Yeah. And uh, 
of course, my wife is from Kingston, Jamaica, so she's always playing reggae. Yeah. You know, and uh, she also loved Nancy Wilson and the other great singers. So we we listen to, she plays that around the house a lot, so I enjoy listening to that too. Nancy's great, man. Nancy's but, great. Uh, I got it from my own in the car. I think very often I keep referring to JJ. I got to put on JJ's records because, yeah. you know, and I don't play his licks or copy his style, no for note or nothing, but the level that he plays on. Yeah. yeah. Nobody surpassed that. The clarity, the, 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 just the, the, the clarity, not only of his sound and articulation and rhythm, but the clarity of his thought is like compositions. It's, it, it, Cedar Walton's like that too. The solo, you could have written it out as a composition and come back and edited it and made it perfect, but it just come out of his brain like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like telling a story, but you know, first time uh, makes sense. It's just, you know, it's inspiring to me. And it, like I say, it's not that I want to play his notes or copy his style per se, but just that level. That level, yeah. You know, it, it keeps me honest, you know. And speaking of trombone players, another guy we didn't mention who I love, uh, Gretchen Moncure the third. Oh, yeah, Gretchen, yeah. Yeah, we just lost him recently. A great yeah. player. I still listen to those two uh, Blue Note records that he had put out in the 60s. And, you know, I and I, yeah. I favor some other stuff, but I like Ev yeah. I like Evolution too. Evolution's great, but I like some other stuff. Man, that's my favorite. I recorded one of those tunes for Grace. Oh, really? Wow. It's called Sandy Way. Boom, beep, pop, boom, beep. Yeah, yeah. That's the one. Yeah. Do, 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 you know, that's man. A good one. Hey, you ever? You know something that uh, I I could see you doing, and I think it would sound beautiful with your concept and this you and Wayne Short are doing something. I mean, probably not now, you know, because of his health, but I would have loved for you guys to have really done something together. You know, I Wayne would Shorter. have too. <laughs> <laughs> I know Wayne. I played with him once at Carnegie Hall, but it was a special concert for Buddhists because we're both Buddhists, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was a special concert, and he wrote this music, and I played in it. And, and with Robin Eubanks, who's also Buddhist. Yeah. Now, Robin is one of my favorite young trombone well he's not young anymore but when i met him he was uh he's younger than me but he's he, fantastic the whole family is just gifted you yeah know, when i was talking to kevin kevin and i didn't even know this no i think one of the guys i think it was robin it told me that kenny Barron had studied with their mother piano lessons when kenny Barron was small i didn't even know that he said yeah oh, and he studied with, with our mother yeah so that was uh, something that I didn't know. But uh, but listen, man, I want to thank you so much for being on Jazz Talk. It's been an honor and a pleasure just to sit here and chat with you and just talk about life and music, man. Hang on, I'm about to close out the show. Well, you've heard it from the great Steve Ture. And as the saying goes, if the music grooves and makes you move, it must be jazz. I'm Preston Williams with Jazz Talk signing off. Peace.